We're now going to begin our final class on Job. This is going to cover uh, from chapters 38 to 42. So this is the very end of the poetic section of the book of Job. And what I want to do is I want to give an outline of this whole section, just the different bits and pieces. And then I'm going to go in. There's a couple of um, what I'm calling hinge points. And I'm calling it that because your interpretation of these two sections, I think, influences how you view all of the book of Job itself. So we'll focus in on that, talk about some possible interpretations from that, and then I'll leave us with some uh, questions for further discussion. So without further ado, let's get started. So the beginning of this section in 38, uh, in verses 1 through 3, we get God answering Job out of the whirlwind, which is a good translation of that word in Hebrew. I've also seen tempest, gale, or heavy windstorm. So it's a pretty big thing. This same word that's used here is um, actually used in Second Kings um, chapter 2, verse 11. And it's when Elijah is taken, taken up in the chariots of fire, uh, where the movie Chariots of Fire gets its name from. So uh, in this sense, it's just sort of a general manifestation of the Lord. We also get the same word in Isaiah 29, 6, as well as in Jeremiah 23, 19, and Jeremiah 30, 23. So in all of those sections, this word has a harsher meaning. It's usually connected with God's wrath or God's anger. So uh, Davidson in her notes in the New Interpreter's um, Bible, which is the NRSV version, um, she really focuses in on the wind, whirlwind as the anger. She mentions all of these verses, but she focuses in on that as, as the anger. So um, we have a choice here in what to think. Um, it could be that that's what this is saying, that the Lord is angry at Job. It could just be a sign that the Lord has appeared. So um, hard to know, open to interpretation. How you feel about the rest of the text probably will influence your interpretation of that. Um, but those are the two different views that we've got there. The first thing that the Lord says to Job here, um, we get in verse 3, um, gird up your loins like a man. And basically what that's saying is be prepared, get ready, because I'm, I'm coming in, coming in right now. And that leads us to the next section, um, and this is from chapter 38, verse 4, all the way to chapter 40, verse 2. So this is God's description, which basically, I'll sum up by saying, uh, God is basically telling Job the things he, God, can do, but that Job can't. So this gives a sense of where God is versus where Job is in, as far as ability. So the interesting thing about um, what's going on here with God's descriptions of what he can do versus what Job can do, or rather cannot do, is God seems to be in agreement with what Job and um, Eliu have said earlier. Um, sometimes with similar words and phrasings, but basically just that God's up here and Job and everyone else are down here, um, that there's that divide between them. That, that seems very much to be in agreement with what Job and um, Eliu have said earlier, which just an interesting thing to keep in mind. After this, we get Job's response. So God kind of gives gives a little break in, in what he's saying. 
And so in chapter 40, verses 3 through 5, we get Job's response. Basically what he says here, I'll I'll go ahead and read it out. Um, Then Job answered the Lord, See, I am of small account. What shall I answer you? I lay my hand on my mouth. I've spoken once. I will not answer twice, but will proceed no further. So basically he says, you know, that's really all I have to say. And um, I'd say, and and this is kind of thinking back to some of the things that uh, my Old Testament professor in seminary, Becky Wright, used to say to us. uh, Job is kind of wimping out a little bit here. God's given him a chance to um, speak to him directly. And uh, Job just is kind of afraid and doesn't want to say anything. So he just, he's given the chance he's been looking for and then he kind of wimps out. So after that, we get God's response back to Job. Um, So this is chapter 40, verses six through eight. And we're going to talk about this uh, particular response um, later because it's one of our hinge points. Then after that, in chapter 40, um, verse 9, through chapter 41, verse 24, uh, the end of chapter 41, that is, um, God uh, goes into a further description. So this is like what he said before, except this time he focuses on the great beast of the sea, um, such as the Leviathan. Um, mythical beasts that um, we usually don't talk about except when we're talking about mythology or the behemoth. So huge monsters like that. Then we get Job's final words in chapter 42, verses 1 through 6. And then after that, we get the the final um, section that we've talked about before, the end um of the book, which is another uh, prose section versus a poetry section like this one. And that's the other hinge point, so we're going to come back to that one as well. But first, we're going to go back to chapter 40, um, verses 6 through 8, focusing in particularly on verse 8, where God says, Will you even put me in the wrong? Will you condemn me? that you may be justified. And this is the NRSV version that we're looking at here. Now, the uh, put me in the wrong is really interesting because it's used as the translation um, in back in Job uh, 19, verse 6. So this is one of Job's speeches. Uh, but... In looking at that further, in the Hebrew, there are very different phrases that are being translated in the same words in English, and I'm not, I'm not really sure why that is. Um, This is kind of where I hit hit a wall, so I'm not sure why. Um, The NRSV, um, and I believe the NIV, I looked at as well, and possibly uh, the ESV versions of the Bible. I mean, this is a, a common that these two different phrases are translated the same way. Again, I'm not sure why. I, I wish they were the same in Hebrew because it would uh, make the interpretation of this particular bit a little bit easier. Um, looking again back at, at Job earlier and what Job has said, God actually takes two words Job uses, uh, and this is back in chapter 9, uh, verse 19 and 20. Uh, judgment... Uh, which is part of the phrase that's translated here is put me in the wrong, and be just. Um, so are the be justified at the end. So uh, the point here being, God's taking a few phrases that Job is using. I mean, he's certainly looking at the broader picture of what Job is saying. But... Is God trying to show there, and this is an implication that um, my, again, my Old Testament professor in seminary, Becky Wright, used to say to us um, that 
God is trying to show here that he's lis- he's been listening to Job, that he's been there and present. Now, it would be easier to say that that was exactly the case if God used the exact same phrase that Job was using before, which we have done in the English, um, but it, it's not present, at least in what I've been able to find in the Hebrew. So is that what God's trying to say? Is he trying to say here, um, you know, hey, I've, I've been listening to you. I know what you've been saying. Don't wimp out on me now. Um, or not. Um, it's, it's hard to say. We don't have enough data, enough uh, information to go on here. Um, but depending on what your view is of this particular section, it changes the way that we interpret this particular passage. If um, we could look at this as God getting angry at Job again um, because Job won't answer himself, or we could look at this as God saying, hey, look, I've been here. I've been listening to what you've been saying. I have been present even though you didn't know it. Um, And I think if that's what's being said here, that's really a very powerful lesson that we gain from this text. So, open to interpretation, but this is one of the hinge points, I think, for how we're going to interpret Job. The second one is Job's response to God at the very end. So, this is at the start of 42, and uh, we're going to look um, particularly at verse 6. So, Job chapter 42, verse 6, and here Job says, Therefore, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. Again, this is the NRSV version, but other versions of the Bible and English have it a similar way. And this is unfortunately a verse that's not very well translated most of the time. Um, And I'm going to focus on two words in particular here. Um, The first is demise. So... That would be amos in Hebrew. This word um, has a multitude of meanings. It can mean either to refuse or reject. Um, So this would be in the sense that Job is rejecting what he's said before or recanting, going back on what have you. Um, It can also mean to vanish. um, And... Again, going back to Becky Wright, uh, she would say melt away would be the meaning here, Um, which I think has the same sense as as vanish. Uh, So that's, again, this is a very, like, very open for interpretation. What exactly is is Job saying? Um, If it's refuse or reject, then there's maybe a sense that Job is repenting of what he said before. If it's a sense of vanish or melt away, I'm not really sure uh, what Job is saying then. It could be what he's saying is that um, sort of in the presence and awe of the Lord, he melts away, that his importance seems less. But again, I'm not really sure. Uh, that's just kind of a, a speculation. I think that's something that each and every one of us needs to take some time to reflect on. Um, but the main choice that we have here for whether we choose refuse or reject or vanish or melt away as as the meaning of that word in Moss here that often is translated as despise, is Job actually repenting of what he said? Or is he just accepting the answer that God has given him? Is that really the gist of what he's trying to say there? So that's the first word I want to focus on. The the second word um, is repent. And uh, the Hebrew word for that is uh, nahamati, which I probably butchered there. But um, this word can also mean comforted. 
And in fact, at the very end of this, in chapter 42, 11, in the, um, in the prose section, we get here um, that uh, then there came to him, Job, all his brothers and sisters, and all who had known him before, and they ate bread with him in his house. They showed him sympathy and comforted him for all the evil that the Lord had brought upon him. So comforted him there, I looked it up, it is the exact same word that we get here as meaning repent. Um, later, it's, it clearly means to comfort. Um, because clearly his family isn't repenting themselves of, of Job or anything like that. So the better translation here, what we should have translated, and I will note the um, ESV study Bible actually has this as a footnote as a possible translation. Uh, so the better translation here would be, I am comforted, and instead of in the, um, the, the preposition there actually means um, upon or um, on, concerning, um, that sort of thing. So the better translation instead of uh, I am repent in dust and ashes is I am comforted concerning dust and ashes. So again, the idea being that um, Job is comforted with his current situation after talking to God, possibly, depending again on how we look at that first word, um, Emmaus, if we want to translate that as despise or vanish. So with that all said, um, here's the possible interpretations for what's going on um, in Job, particularly because of this section uh, that I've been able to find. The first is that God is a cosmic bully. And Davidson, uh, for the New Interpreter's Bible, and I get a little frustrated with the notes here about it, um, is uh, basically um, the idea is that God won't be sorry. And, and to use the, the, her words um, on the notes here, um, her interpretation of 42.6, uh, Job's words at the end, is that Job is not sorry for confronting God. Instead, he seems to be accepting that God will never give him what he wants, an apology. So I think that's a very problematic view um, for a lot of reasons. Even though this isn't God himself in this text, I don't know that we necessarily want to say that a text that is part of our spiritual canon is talking about God in a way that makes him out to be a bully. So I could be wrong, but that's my thoughts on that. Another possible interpretation is that Job is a repentant sinner. This is uh, the view that the NIV study Bible takes in its notes. Um, and uh, it's... Maybe what a lot of different Bibles take as their, their notes. I remember talking about this in our Old Testament class, um, that um, maybe our way of translating Job's words at the end is because we want to make him out to be a sinner or we want him to have repented somehow or, or something like that. I think that's also problematic because the whole point uh, at the beginning of this book is that Job um, hasn't sinned. He's suffering for uh, the reason of this cosmic battle. And I don't know that we want to go back on that now unless we want to say that Job's response since then has been wanting. Um, but then if we say that, we have a problem at the end with him getting returned twice as much as we had before. So there's just, there's a lot of problems, I think, with that view too. 
Then Thomas Long, in his book, uh, What Shall We Say? Evil, Suffering, and the Crisis of Faith, basically he looks at this part of Job as God is presenting us with a new view of justice, Uh, which I don't think is is bad, and and I certainly don't think is wrong. I I think we probably should be careful with that. I think maybe careful is not the right word. We want to be very mindful of what that means. So if God is giving us this new view of justice, it means that our way of justice is different from God's. So as we hear in scripture, your ways are not my ways, says the Lord. Um, I've been reading Philip Yancey's book on um, what's so amazing about grace is the title. And there's a lot about grace and forgiveness in there. And, um, one of the things that, that uh, as I've been reading that, I've been thinking about with this is that you know, we want this, um, you do something wrong, something bad happens to you, or you get some sort of punishment. Um, we want a um, karmic sense of, of justice. You do something bad, something bad happens to you. And... Um, God's ways that we see in the New Testament particularly is that there's forgiveness and so that there's not that same view of justice is that God is willing to let things go. Um, God's willing to let us forego punishment, um, which sometimes we deserve, Um, which I think is something we often fight against. In, in this world. So I think that's something to keep in mind here with this sort of idea that God is presenting a new view of of justice um, or a new view of why suffering happens. Um, because again, it's, it's putting God's way versus our way in that. But I think there's a lot to be said for that. Um, The last two interpretations are the ones that I'm leaned more towards, um, a little bit with Long as well, but I think these are probably the the better ones. Um, One is, is Becky writes, that God is present with us in our suffering. And I think this depends on how you interpret the hinge points. Um, I'm not fully convinced myself that God is saying that um, he's been there the whole time, uh, it just just from what the text says. Uh, and, and part of that is I want to believe that. And I want I, at some point I want to look at this even further than I, I have before this class and see what's um, going on in the, in the text even more. I think there's a lot to imply. That, that God is saying, look, I've been listening to what you, you've been saying. Uh, both in his words in 48 and really his entire speech, it's similarities to what Job and Eli were saying. Um, but again, I don't know that we have enough there to say, to, to say that yet. Um, and I think, as with all parts of Scripture, we want to take the time to see what is actually being said in the text, not what do we want it to say. So that's kind of why I'm a little hesitant to just go full on and say, yes, this is it. Um, The last view um, is presented by Anderson in um, Understanding the Old Testament, is that we can't even know the answer to the question of suffering, uh, which I do think is a big part of what's going on here. Um, I do think this book is a lot about wrestling. Um, And I I think that a lot of what God is saying is is probably getting at, um, it it may or may not, I think a lot of it we could see is getting at is this is where God is. This is the most we know about suffering, um, which is not really that much at all when you think about it so um that's all i've got there um questions for discussion if you want to do a 
Bible study uh, for those listening at home uh, on this later. Um, here's some discussion questions to think about. Um, and you'll be able to find this all, if you're listening to this on YouTube, you'll be able to find this all on um, the blog as well in written form. So the first, um, which is really a group of questions, is what do we think God is doing here? You know, after looking at this part of the text, is is he a cosmic bully or is he simply stating that he's there and present with us in our trouble? The second is why does the author of Job choose to put these words in God's mouth? Um, these words being his entire speech to Job. Um, is it because God's sovereignty is the only thing we can know, that we do know? Uh, is the question of suffering unanswerable? Our third question, um, in Job 40, verse 6 through 8, God is chastising Job for doing, is he chastising Job for doing something wrong or for not speaking up when he was offered the chance? So when, when God says to Job, um, again, gird up your loins like a man. I will question you and you declare to me. Will you even put me in the wrong? Will you condemn me that you may be justified? So is he saying, is God saying there that, that Job has done something wrong, deserving of punishment? Or on the other hand, is he saying, Job, don't wimp out on me now. I just gave you a chance to speak up like you've been asking for and all you said is, I don't have anything more to say. And then the final question, what do you think about Job's final response? Is he repenting? If so, what is he repenting of? And does he need to repent? So that's all I've got for that. Um, thank you all for listening and uh, tune in for the, our future classes um, that we'll do. Um, now that we've finished the book of Job. Thanks.